Good morning, everybody. We are going to start uh, this session. That uh, Anaparthi uh, Satyanarayanagar Reddigari session is uh, award session. So I think all the presenters yes, are here. Yeah. We found it. We found it. Yeah. First, uh, Chinna Chinnan Gola uh, Viveka Nandini. Please come. She will be presenting a paper on role of IOL decentration, manual, small incision, cataract surgery, and their visual outcomes performed by. Good morning, everyone. My topic for today's presentation is rate of IOL decentration in manual small incision cataract surgery and their visual outcomes performed by fellows. There is a continuous need to provide more cataract surgical services in developing countries. Ophthalmology residency programs play a critical role in training the surgeons. Various studies have shown an inverse relation between the number of surgeries performed by a resident and adverse surgical outcomes. So there is a need to understand the relation between resident's surgical experience and adverse surgical outcomes in manual small incision cataract surgeries. The aim of this study is to analyze the rate of IOL decentration in manual small incision cataract surgery and their visual outcomes performed by fellows this is a retrospective cohort study performed from May 2022 to May 2023 at a tertiary eye hospital in India. Resurgery is performed for index manual small incision cataract surgery by fellows based on their surgical experience were evaluated and categorized into four groups. Seniors, that is, who had a surgical experience of more than one year, juniors with an experience of less than one year, and those who had a prior surgical experience of having performed less than 100 SICS surgeries and more than 100 SICS. And this data was analyzed using computerized database. Resurgeries done within 30 days of surgery were captured and analyzed. Coming to results, overall we have evaluated 3,957 SICS performed by 12 fellows. The overall resurgery rate was 1.16%. The resurgery rate among seniors was seen to be 0.93% uh, and in juniors it was 2.17%. So there was a statistically significant difference between these two groups, seniors and juniors. And the resurgery rate among those who had less than 100 surgery, uh, surgical experience was 1.29% and more than 100 surgeries it was 2.19% and there was no statistically significant difference between these two groups. And we have seen that IOL decentration, which went for IOL redialing, accounted for 24% of the overall resurgeries. And we have extended our study and found that AC wash and cortical cleanup, they have accounted for a greater percentages of resurgeries, that is 28% and 26% respectively. Among, uh, among the redialing cases done, 86.9% of the cases had a, a post-op visual acuity of 6 by 12 or better, and 13.04% of the cases had 6, uh, 6 by 18 post-op visual acuity. Coming to discussion, SICS is the most commonly performed cataract surgery in developing countries. It is less expensive than FACO and delivers comparable outcomes. Haripriya et al. shows a resurgery rate of 1.17%, similar to our study. Shemed et al. and other studies, they show 0.85% and 1.9% respectively in FACO. Even our study shows similar rates in SICS, which is done by fellows. Haripriya et al. shows a declining trend with increasing surgical experience. Similarly, our study shows higher rates in juniors than seniors, but there was no significant difference in the groups between uh, those who had a prior surgical experience of less than 100 and more than 100. 
Probably this can be due to assignment of least complicated cases segregated preoperatively to the inexperienced surgeons and continuous supervision by senior surgeons. Haripriya et al. shows cortical cleanup and IOL redialing as the most common resurgeries done. In our study, AC wash uh, and or wound reformation followed by cortical cleanup and IOL redialing. Then wound reformation was the most common resurgery done, uh, resurgery seen uh, uh, among the juniors. That is probably due to improper wound construction. And among the seniors, it was cortical cleanup, probably due to assignment of complex cases. Finally, to conclude, manual small incision cataract surgery is a safer technique for early and inexperienced surgeons in a developing country. Resurgery rates show a declining trend with experience among the training surgeons even in complicated cases. The limitation of this study, the total number of complicated cases during this period done by fellows were not analyzed. Thank you. Any questions? I will dialing means uh, from sulcus to bag or bag to sulcus? From sulcus to bag, sir. Okay, fine. Okay. Actually, if you do canopra, uh, do you do in all cases capsule? Yes, sir. We prefer capsule or continuous. Yes, that's a problem. But it's a canopra, that's not an issue of. Uh, I will decentration now. Yes. Fine. Thank you. Thank you. So next presenter will be uh, Dr. Kopparapu on Oak Poenaki Harada disease. Good morning, myself, Dr. Leshna, PJNRI Institute of Medical Sciences, Visakhapatnam. I am here to present Vogue Koenegi Harada disease with Hashimoto's thyroiditis, a rare case report. VKH disease is bilateral granulomatous pan uveitis associated with serious retinal detachment with or without extraocular manifestations affecting young adults. In 1932, Bebel suggested to call this entity as VKH disease. It is T-cell mediated autoimmune reaction associated with HLA DR1, DR4, subtype 0405 and it presents in three forms, complete, incomplete and probable VKH. My case report, a 20-year-old female whose occupation is student came with a chief complaint of defective vision in left eye since three days and headache since one week. Defective vision in left eye is sudden in onset, not associated with pain, redness, photophobia, no history of lotus, no history of ocular trauma, ocular surgery or ocular infection, no history of podopsia, micropsia, macropsia or metamorphopsia, headache which is bilateral frontal, not associated with nausea, vomiting or reeling sensation, no history of tinnitus and hearing impairment. Past history, there is history of prodromal illness five days before defective vision associated with headache, orbital pain, light sensitivity and mild fever. She is a known case of hypothyroidism on tap thyroxine sodium. Personal history, family history or nil significant, menstrual, she is a known case of PCOS. General examination, no signs of meningismus, no signs of alopecia, vitiligo, poliosis, vitals and systemic examination within normal limits. Local examination also within normal limits. Coming to ocular examination, I will get into positive findings. Both eyes uncorrected visual equity is 612 parts, not improving with pinhole, near vision is N6, color vision is 17 by 17, apart from cornea showing fine pigmented capes in a vertical line and AC grade 1 cells, rest of the anterior segment findings in both eyes are within normal limits. IOP with GAT at 11 am recorded in right eye to be 12 and left eye to be 10 mm HG. Fundus, evalu fundus evaluation with IO and 90D showed both eyes media clear, optic disc normal. Macular, serous macular detachment with dull foveal reflex in both eyes. This is a fundus picture of both eyes showing serous macular detachment. Based on the above clinical findings, we came to a provisional diagnosis of probable VKH disease with hypothyroidism, query Hashimoto's thyroiditis. On further clinical evaluation, OCT macula showed both eyes multiple pockets of subretinal fluid showing neurosensory retinal detachment with RPE alteration and choroidal thickening. FFA has been done showing both eyes early hypo with multiple pinpoint hyperfluorescence with RPE alteration establishing our diagnosis. B scan showing both eyes increased choroidal thickening. Her DSH is also elevated, showing 10 micro international units per ml. Adding to it, her anti TPO antibodies were also elevated, showing 6.9 international units per ml, whose biological reference value comes around less than 5.61, suggestive of Hashimoto's thyroiditis. 
to exclude other autoimmune etiology, we have done ANA showing a weak positive report. Uh, one is to 40 sample dilution. Her ESR is also elevated. She was treated both eyes, periocular triamcinolone astonide injections, along with oral tra trap prednisolone supplemented with pantoprazole, calcium, and thyroxine sodium 50 micrograms once daily with regular TSH monitoring. Referral has been done to ENT and Dermat, uh, where both came within normal limits to exclude other possible hearing etiology or integumentary signs. Review after one week, visual acuity in right eye improved to 6-9 parts and left eye it is 6-6 parts. Simultaneous OCT, if you see, this is the right eye pre-periocular steroid macula status and this is post-steroid injections. All the subretinal fluid got resolved along with RPE changes in both eyes. Review after one week, there is modification in the treatment regimen. Tab mycophenolate morphotil 500 mg once daily is added the following week along with the oral prednisolone tapering 5 mg weekly. Here if we see incremental doses of TAB 500 mg uh, OD to TID while uh, steroid dose has been tapered from 60 to 45 tapering 5 mg weekly. Now currently she is on TAB prednisolone 10 mg OD and MMF 500 mg TID along with thyroxine sodium 50 micrograms OD with regular TSH monitoring and follow up. Discussion in our case good visual acuity is achieved by early diagnosis with OCT FFA followed by aggressive therapy with periocular and oral steroids in acute uveitic stage and maintenance therapy with a combination of steroid and anti-metabolites. MMF being safe and effective steroid sparing drug is preferred anti-metabolite in combination with steroids on long term treatment as it prevents progression of VKH to chronic recurrent stage. Diagnosis of Hashimoto's with positive anti-TP1 antibodies, exclusion of other autoimmune disorders like lupus choroidopathy with negative ANA and referral to ENT dermat departments for evaluation of extraocular manifestations is important in our case management. Visual prognosis depends upon early treatment with steroids and immunosuppressants that results in fair prognosis with 60 to 70 percent retaining vision 6-9 or even better as achieved in my case. Prevention of recurrence of disease leading to choroidal neovascular membrane and subretinal fibrosis is important to restore good visual potential. My case highlights the importance of management and evaluation of VKH in detail to find out any other asso associated autoimmune disorders like Hashimoto's that can lead to serious systemic complications like heart, heart failure, lymphoma, etc. These are my references. Thank you. So far, so far fast uh, presentation. Any steroid side effects you noted? No, we, ha we have regularly monitored our CBP liver function tests. They are within normal limits, ma'am. Uh, uh, how long you followed her? We are following even till date, ma'am. We are, we are seeing her since six months. Have you shown in the ANT department? Yes, ma'am. Pure, no. yes, pure tone audiometry came within normal limits. Uh. She per se also does. Poliosis, vitiligo, okay. alopecia, all integumentary signs will be there. So. Thanks. Thanks. Be presenting a paper on a study on ocular manifestations in orbital wall fractures. Good morning, I'm Dr. Saujanya and I'm going to present a paper on a study on ocular manifestations in orbital wall fractures. Uh, no financial conflicts of interest to disclose. Orbital wall fractures are seen in a significant number of patients presenting to the hospital with blunt trauma to the orbit which can be limited to the orbital cavity alone or associated with complex fractures of other facial bones. They can be seen in various modes of injury such as road traffic accidents, assault, self-fall, uh, sport injuries, etc. Some of the serious complications that are associated with orbital wall fractures include muscle entrapment, tra uh, traumatic cataract, subluxation or dislocation of lens, sclerocorneal tear, ruptured globe, globe malposition, optic nerve injury which can be direct or indirect. Functional Im impairment and aesthetic deformity are the long-term sequelae of orbital wall fractures and are of important concern for the treating of ophthalmic surgeon. My aims and objectives are to study the etiology of orbital wall fractures and common ocular features that are associated with reduced visual outcome and an early intervention to improve visual prognosis. The inclusion criteria were all orbital wall injury patients proven radiologically coming to the ophthalmology OPD and emergency room. All modes of injury, all age groups, male and female patients and unilateral bilateral cases were included. Exclusion criteria were previous history of head and ocular injury, patient not willing for radiological examination, congenital ocular and orbital anomalies, uncooperative, disoriented, unconscious and comatose patients. Methods and materials are a prospective study of 40 cases of orbital wall fractures conducted at the Department of Ophthalmology, GGH Kakana 
Canada over a period of uh, over a period from August 2022 to May 2023. And all cases with CT scan or radiological evidence of orbital wall fractures were included and the finding and detailed ocular examination noted. And the CT scan findings were documented as walls involved, rim involvement, entrapment of soft tissues, entrapment of extraocular muscle, sinus involvement, orbital emphysema and other findings. And the treatment was given, uh, was divided into medical and surgical. Medical management in the form of observation under cover of systemic antibiotics and anti-inflammatory drugs given for patients with no functional li functionally limiting diplopia, negative FDT, cosmetically accepted and of thermos and no entrapment of muscle or soft tissues. Well, surgical management in the form of orbital wall reconstruction was given for patients with indication like functionally limiting diplopia in primary or down gaze, positive FDT, significant and of thermos and CT scan evidence of large fracture or muscle entrap. The results were age, uh, uh, most of the cases fall in the age group between 20 to 30 years and males were more common than females and unilateral eye involvement uh, was more common than bilateral and road traffic accident was the most common mode of injury and closed globe injury being the most common type of injury. Among conjunctival involvement, subconjunctival hemorrhage was the most common manifestation and epithelial defect was the most common corneal manifestation and scleral involvement was seen in the form of scleral tear in just two cases. And then uh, among the walls involved, floor is the most common wall to be involved and least is the roof. And vitreous was seen in anterior chamber in one case and hyphema, gross hyphema seen in two cases. And among lens involvement, the most common manifestation is subluxation of lens. And periorbital edema was seen in all 40 cases, uh, restriction of eye movements in six cases and diplopia in five cases. And uh, infraorbital nerve was the most common nerve to be involved followed by optic nerve. Coming to discussion, our study shows that 46 percentage of the cases were between 20 to 30 years, while Elizabeth Chiang et al. study shows that 31.6 percentage were between 20 to 30 years and the least common age group was 60 to 70 years and walls involved floor is the most common with 50 percentage medial next medial wall 25 percentage lateral wall 17 and roof being least which is almost similar to the study conducted by Elizabeth Chiang et al. In gender distribution 80 percentage cases were males and 20 percentage were females which was almost similar to Stephen Terrell et al. study and road traffic accident was the co uh, cause in 65 percentage of cases while Michael E. Roser et al. study shows that 72.25 percentage of the orbital wall fractures were due to RTA. Laterality bilateral ocular involvement was seen in 10 percentage of our cases while Hedy Elsman study shows only 2 percentage of the cases had bilateral ocular involvement. So the summary is that the commonest age group were young adult males between 20 to 30 years and posterior segment involvement was less than the anterior segment. Multiple orbital wall fractures are more common than isolated orbital wall fractures. As I have said, 100% of my cases had periorbital edema and ecchymosis and sclerocorneal tear and hyphema were seen in two cases and multiple orbital wall fractures are more common than isolated and uh, among uh, the orbital wall fractures, floor is the most common wall to be involved and conclusion, my study helps for better understanding of common ocular manifestations in different types of orbital wall fractures, early diagnosis, treatment, referral that aids in better visual outcome with early interventions and it enumerates the various grievous injuries that are associated with orbital wall fractures and a poor visual outcome associated. Road traffic accident being the main cause, strict road traffic regulations must be followed and general population must be made aware of the preventive measures. These are my references and thank you. Uh, what is road fracture? Uh, any uh, blunt trauma to the orbit with an object larger than the size of the eye, madam, uh, will result in trans uh, transmission uh, fracture of any of the wall, usually the weakest wall, which is being the floor, uh, without in most of the cases without involving the rim, madam. What is blow-in fracture? Uh, usually in cases of uh, roof, uh, uh, fracture of the orbital roof, uh, seen uh, the, the fractured pieces, instead of coming out, go inside. increased intraorbital pressure and uh, roof uh, it is associated with optic nerve injury madam because the she uh, sheath of the optic nerve is in con the dura of the optic nerve is in continuous with the peri see that uh, is there in case of uh, blow uh, uh, how many cases have the optic nerve involved 1.1 percentage cases Later we have five cases sir optic nerve involvement
Good morning, everyone. I'm Dr. Y. Virendra, and I'm here to present my paper on instance of eye diseases in rural and tribal population in Narsipatnam during district residency program. There is no financial interest in this study. Access to quality healthcare is a fundamental right, yet many rural communities face significant challenges in obtaining necessary medical services. Among the crucial healthcare services often overlooked in rural and tribal areas are the eye examination and the early detection of eye diseases. India rural population for 2021 was 96.8 crores and tribes constitute 8.6 percent which is about 10.4 crores. Rural communities often encounter unique challenges when it comes to eye examination and eye disease management. Some of the key obstacles include limited availability of eye care facilities, distance and transportation and socio-economic factors. My objective is to shed light to ascertain the importance of eye examination and the incidence of eye diseases in rural and tribal areas in Narsipatnam during DRP and to explore the screening methods and to create awareness for periodical eye examination and to categorize, to categorize the subjects based on various ocular diseases. This is a hospital-based analytical observational study conducted in 154 patients for a period of three months from March 2023 to May 2023 in area hospital Narsipatnam. All the patients attending to ophthalmology OPD in area hospital Narsipatnam were included in the study and the patients less than seven years of age were excluded and patients who did not give consent were also excluded. All the subjects underwent comprehensive ophthalmic examination where visual equity, automated refraction, subjective verification were done, intraocular pressure was recorded by applanation tonometry, anterior segment and detailed fundus examination were done with slit lamp and 78D lens. These were the results showing the distribution of the population in which the rural population were more in this study which accounted for 74.02 percentage followed by the tribal population which is 25.97 percent. This is the age distribution table showing 51.94 percentage of the patients were in the age group more than 45 years followed by 21 to 45 years age group which is 33.11 percentage. This is the sex distribution chart showing male predominance in this study, which is 51.94 percentage. These are the frequency of ocular diseases in which the cataracts, lenticular diseases were more in this study, which is 34.41 percent, followed by refractive errors, which is 26.62, followed by conjunctival diseases, retinal diseases, glaucoma, corneal diseases, and adnexal pathology. In our study, most frequented ocular disease is the cataracts, which is 34.41 percentage. Following studies also have cataracts as the most frequent ocular disease. Pooja H. V. et al. She conducted a hospital-based cross-sectional study from July 2018 to June 2019 in patients aged 40 to 80 years amongst 2,912 subjects in which males were more and the cataract was the most frequented ocular disease in her study. According to APEDS, which is Andhra Pradesh Eye Disease Study, which was a population-based study conducted to determine the prevalence and causes of blindness and visual impairment in 11,786 subjects by multi-state sampling belonging to urban, rural, tribal population in Andhra Pradesh, cataract and refractive error were responsible for 60.3 percentage of blindness and 85.7 percent of moderate visual impairment. Praveen Vashist et al. He conducted a population-based study in 2022, which is the recent study in persons aged 50 years above and concluded that cataract was more common in his study followed by retinal diseases. Few studies showed other ocular diseases as most frequent in the population. Anupama Kumar et al. conducted a community-based cross-sectional study in 2016 in 812 patients in which males constitute 51.4 percentage and myopia was more common in that study followed by cataracts. V. K. Schroet et al. He conducted a community-based cross-sectional study in 2005 in 925 subjects and concluded myopia was more common followed by conjunctival xerosis, hypermetropia, pterygium and cataract. To conclude, as the specialist medical services are scanty in rural and tribal areas in India, there is need to conduct more screening and awareness camp to combat the avoidable blindness. By emphasis on education, we can bridge the gap and improve the eye health outcome for rural communities, enabling a brighter future for their residents. This can be done with trained paramedical assistance and by teleophthalmic services, we can make significant progress in ensuring equitable eye care services for all. Campaigns for public awareness regarding surgical correction for cataract and correction for refractive errors should be strengthened. These are my references. Finally, thank you. In children, what errors you found? Uh, 
myopia. So. And how many amblyopia? In my study, sir. Uh, yeah. Um, I'll not take okay. amblyopia. Thank you. be presenting a paper on IOP monitoring preoperatively and preoperatively and postoperatively our experience at the PSR government regional eye hospital Karnal Medical College Karnal. Good morning everyone. My name is Dr. Rajesh Kunanki. Today I will be presenting a paper on IOP monitoring preoperatively and postoperatively. Our observations at Dr. Perigrusio Reddy Government Regional Eye Hospital Karnal Medical College. Inflammation is a natural response to tissue damage due to cataract surgery, which can be damaging to the ocular environment. Steroids by any route inhibit production of leukotrienes and prostaglandins, thus decreasing the inflammation, hastening the recovery process and better visual outcomes. Steroids have significant side effects and the most common complication being increase in intraocular pressure. Steroid responders are a set of patients who experience significant corticosteroids increase in intraocular pressure. Other risk factors that increases IOP include pre-existing glaucoma, advanced age, diabetes, high myopia, pseudo-exfoliation, vitreous, residual cortex, or viscoelastics in anterior chamber. Persistent elevation in IOP can lead to optic nerve damage and vision loss. Coming to the inclusion criteria, we took patients between age, uh, age 50 to 80 years. Sex, both males and females were taken. Underwent, uh, patients who underwent uneventful small incision cataract surgery or PACO emulsification. Exclusion criteria, patient who had previous history of glaucoma, with complicated cataracts and previous history of iodocyclitis, patient with complications during cataract surgery, patients already on corticosteroid treatment, either topical or systemic, patients who have connective tissue disorders. The aim of this study is to evaluate IOP fluctuation following cataract surgery with topical corticosteroids. This is an observational cross-section study of 200 patients connected to a period of three months. All patients' IOP was recorded by non-contact tonometer pre-operatively and post-operatively at first day, first week, second week, fourth week, and sixth week. Patients were given topical eye drops in weekly tapering doses with fixed drop combination of 0.3% gatifloxacin and 0.1% dexamethasone sodium phosphate. High-risk patients were given NSAIDs eye, uh, eye drops uh, such as flybriprofen and apafenac after second week and lubricant eye drops in suspected dry eyes. Following parameters were assessed, fluctuation in IOP from the baseline, difference in recorded IOP at different time period, age and sex, steroid response was graded according to the rise in IOP from baseline as study done by Armali et al. According to the study, low fluctuation, rise in IOP less than 6 millimeters of mercury from the baseline IOP, medium fluctuation 6 to 15 millimeters of mercury, high fluctuation rise in IOP greater than 50 millimeters of mercury. Coming to the results, in our study, we observed steroid-induced IOP elevation following topical steroids after four weeks post-op. The prevalence of steroid responders in our study was 9%, which is 18 patients. Mild rise in, uh, was seen in 5.5% uh, patients, and moderate rise was seen in 3.5% patients. 3.5% patients. None of the pa patients in our study group showed severe rise in IOP. Highest mean IOP was 23.5 millimeters of mercury, noted at fourth week post-op follow-up. And second highest was 21.23 uh, millimeters of mercury, noted at first week, which was due to mostly inflammatory reaction. Males among, the, among our study are higher in number. Patients between the age group 56 to 60 years are higher in our uh, study. Coming to the results, we observed that at the first day, there is decrease in intraocular pressure by 1.03 millimeters of mercury. There is subsequent rise in intraocular pressure by 5.98 millimeters of mercury at first week and 8.27 millimeters of mercury at fourth week. Now this graph shows there is a peak in at the first week and the fourth week. Coming to the discussion, uh, the study done by Armali et al. demonstrated that older adult uh, patients were at higher risk for steroid-induced increase in IOP uh, than, uh, rather than the younger adult patients. According to the st uh, study done by Kusni et al., it showed that they did not find any statistical significant difference between the age group and the genders as compared to the IOP rise after surgery. According to the study conducted by Hong Vu Kyu Tong et al., it demonstrated that topical NSAIDs are equally efficacious when compared to topical steroids and ophthalmologists should consider using two-drug regimen. The paradigm shift in pharmacotherapy post uncomplicated cataract surgery has deviated little from the norm as indicated by American Academy of Ophthalmology. In our study, we observed that there was statistical significant difference, p-value being 0.03 in mean IOP between pre-operative with post-operative follow-up. 
the mean IOP on fourth week following cataract surgery was higher than pre-operative, which gradually decreased till six week follow-up. The shortcomings of our study is sample size is small, IOP was measured by non-contact tonometer only. There was comparison not done between the patients undergoing SICS and FACO emulsification. Surgeries was done by senior faculty and postgraduates. All the patients were put on fixed drug combination, supplied our hospital, and not compared with other steroid regimens. Coming to the conclusion, steroid induced IOP elevation was observed mostly after four weeks of topical steroid therapy. The prevalence of steroid responders is sig relatively significant in a study sample. Thus, coming to the conclusion that topical steroids should be used judiciously. Topical steroids should be tapered early and can be replaced or supplemented with topical NSAIDs and lubricant eye drops. In most cases, the IOP lowers spontaneously to the baseline within two weeks upon stopping the drug. This is a small study which highlights the need of IOP evaluation at every post-op follow-up and need for alternative safe post-op treatment regimens. Thank you. Basically, it is done for steroid induced IOP. Yes, yeah, fine. Uh, then, uh, did you ask the history of uh, prior uh, steroid, uh, topical steroid? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We have using steroids to any other reason yes sir we have to other studies what is the what is the minimum time that will take to get steroid response so uh, i don't know this answer but 3 weeks but yes, it's okay sir. it's reasonable yes, okay. yes sir when uh, do you think what is the treatment given to the steroid responders Uh, sir, we are usually uh, follow following the patient after the, we are stopping the steroids in that first and we'll observe if there is any decrease in the uh, IOP in the subsequent visit. If it's not def uh, decreasing, we'll put the patient on topical uh, uh, this, uh, NSAIDs. NSAIDs or uh, we can so use IOP lowering drugs. Sir. Okay, fine. Do you think how long we should give? <coughs> sir, uh, uh, sir, we are, uh, if uh, we will we'll check in the subsequent uh, follow-up, sir, if the IOP is measured, measuring is coming lower in the uh, two subsequent visits, then we'll uh, slowly taper that uh, dosage. Okay, fine. Okay. Fine. Okay. Uh, next presenter will be Kasparthi Vasavi. She will be presenting a paper on is there any correlation between dry eye symptoms and mybography findings by autoreflex with diabetes? Good morning, everyone. I'm Dr. Vasavi. My topic for presentation is, is there a correlation between the dry eye symptoms and the mybography findings by autorefractometer in individuals with diabetes? Financial disclosure, no conflict of interest. Dry eye is a common disorder which causes discomfort and vision issues due to abnormal tear production, evaporation or tear composition. Mebomian glands in the eyelids form the lipid component of the tear film, helps in the prevention of the tear evaporation and maintaining the tear film stability. When these glands small function, it is called as Mebomian gland dysfunction or MGD. Dry eye affects the mebomian glands through various mechanisms and causing the mebomian gland dysfunction. Autorefractometers commonly used for checking the refractory errors have infrared technology for visualizing the mebomian glands. This simplifies the study of gland abnormalities and their connection to the dry eye symptoms in people with diabetes due to their widespread availability. The aim of the study is to investigate the potential correlation between the dry eye symptoms and the mebography findings assessed by an autorefractometer in people with diabetes. This is a cross-sectional study, 50 patients with diabetes mellitus with dry eye symptoms who fulfill the inclusion and exclusion criteria are included in the study. Inclusion criteria is age more than or equal to 18 years, symptoms of dry eye. Exclusion criteria is re recent ocular surgery, ocular or systemic conditions affecting the ocular surface, recent contact lens usage, use of medications affecting the tear production or ocular health, pregnancy or breastfeeding. The study period is three months from June 2023 to August 2023. Data was collected from the subjects who met the inclusion and exclusion criteria. Total 100 eyes of 50 patients were included in the study. The comprehensive evaluation of the study participants included the demographic data, clinical history, slit lamp examination of thorough eyelids, a tear film assessment, and dry eye assessment was done uh, using ocular surface disease index questionnaire to grade the dry eye symptoms, severity. The mubography was uh, done using an autorefractometer uh, it assessed the gland morphology, including the dropouts, obstruction, and tortuosities. A mebomian gland dropout score 
a four grade system proposed by Arita et al is used grade 0 is no gland loss grade 1 is less than one third of the gland dropout grade 2 is one third to two third of the gla gland dropout grade 3 is more than two third and grade 4 is complete gland options this is a sample mebography picture of the patient who is having a mild dry eye symptoms in the left side picture uh, we can see the uh, mebography uh, picture and the right side i have marked uh, here we can see there is a gland loss and gland tortuosities are observed in this patient the beam up expressivity scale is assessed uh, using each eight glands in the central third of the lower eyelid on zero to three scale zero for clear mebum one for cloudy mebum uh, two for cloudy with debris that is gla granular mebum and three for toothpaste like mebum statistical analysis was done using spss program uh, and Pearson correlation was used as a correlation uh, coefficient and p-value is less than 0 0.05 is considered to be statistically significant. The study included 100 ISO 50 patients and 20 fe males and 30 females. Mean age group is 52.02 uh, years. In our study, total 20% are type 1 diabetics and 80% are type 2 diabetics. Age distribution graph, uh, most of the people in our study are belonging to the age group between 44 to 54 years. This is the graph showing OSDI versus the age group. Uh, people with higher age groups have recorded the higher OSDI. And MEBOM expressivity score, most of the people are having a mild, uh, that is grade, type, uh, grade one of MEBOM expressivity score, that is, uh, they are having uh, clear MEBOM. MEBO score versus OSDI score graph. Uh, in our study, most of the people in the di type two diabetes are having higher OSDI scores. Uh, coming to the results, there is a positive correlation between the OSDI scoring versus the MEBO scoring. R value is 0 0.7582 and there is a positive correlation between the MEBO expressi expressivity score versus the MEBO score. R value being 0 0.3321. Coming to the discussion, dry symptoms are linked to the mebomian gland dropout conf confirming the past findings with while mebomian gland tortuosities and SNR changes may exacerbate these symptoms. Dry symptoms and OSDI scores are more in type 2 diabetics than type 1 diabetics and there is no sex, uh, significant sex disparity scores, although more symptoms are see reported by the male. Longer duration of the diabetes have high test scores. Our uh, results are similar to the SEMRA et al, who have done the mebography findings in type 1 diabetics with respect to MEBO scoring. Limitations of my study is it's a cross-sectional study, so and uh, smaller sample size may hamper the subtle correlations. Conclusion, this study highlights the significant correlation between the diabetes and the mebomian gland dysfunction. Longitudinal studies and expanding the sample size may help in future research. It is essential to emphasize the use of autorefractometers for the assessment of mebomian glands in diabetes, for the ease of their use and accessibility in clinical settings. These are my differences. Thank you. They will be announced by the scientific committee chairman, Dr. Madhu Dras.